Well, hey guys, and welcome to another Ask Zach. So today, I want to talk about Steve Cropper. So Steve Cropper is one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, you know, he got me when I was a kid. And kind of going along with that, we're going to talk about an amp that he's probably the most famous user of, the Tweed Fender Harvard. So, uh, as a kid, uh, I started playing guitar about 12, and uh, I remember, um, now I've, I've kind of hinted at this in, the, in, the, in past episodes, but my parents uh, was kind of raised in a Pentecostal church and wasn't really allowed to listen to, quote, secular music, which means I was, I was only really allowed to listen to church music. And there was some good church music, and there was, you know, some bad uh, uh, Christian music also. And uh, the one loophole was I could listen to secular music that was instrumental. So as a kid, I was able to listen to The Ventures and Chet Atkins and this band out of Memphis called Booker T and the MGs. And those albums and those groups, you know, those artists, they really made a huge impact on me. And uh, I remember buying, you know, with my allowance slash money from doing yard work, buying Booker T, Booker T and the MG's Greatest Hits on cassette. I remember buying that and listening to it and just loving it. And then I remember going to my grandmother's house and because uh, my parents, <laughs> they, they wouldn't, they didn't want to have cable because, again, they were trying to protect us from these bad influences, which now as an adult with children, I understand that now. But I would go over to my grandmother's house, and I would watch cable. And, of course, while watching cable, uh, the movie The Blues Brothers came on. And, boy, howdy, did I love that movie. Uh, she had a VCR, so, of course, I found a tape, put it in there, and recorded the whole thing. It was being played on TBS. I know because I, it still has the, the commercials and everything on there. And I watched that thing over and over and over again. Watching, you know, Duck Dunn and Cropper and... Uh, you know, Matt Guitar Murphy, and whoa, what a fun, great movie. I mean, you know, you don't need me to tell you that. Uh, quick side note, um, years ago I bought it on uh, the Blues Brothers movie on DVD, and I brought it home, and I was so excited to play it, you know, for my kids, because I thought, they're going to love this, not realizing that I had been watching the edited for television version well, guess what? I start playing the movie, and all of a sudden, these uh, words that uh, I hadn't heard on the version I had been watching uh, started coming out of their mouths, and my, my kids were like seven or eight years old, and uh, so I had to turn it off. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, there you have the Blues Brothers. Uh, so, I love the Blues Brothers. Uh, then, of course, later when uh, my parents kind of loosened things up when I was 16 and I could kind of buy whatever I wanted to. Of course, I bought, you know, the Albert King uh, that where Booker T and the MGs were backing him up, uh, the Born Under Bad Sign album. Love that album. That's my favorite Albert King record. Um, you know, the Wilson Pickett stuff, the Otis Redding stuff. Oh, my goodness. You know, that the guitar playing and the... You know, the, the double stops and the rhythm chinks and all the things that, uh, you know, Cropper did. Here, I'm just going to play a little bit. So I've got my 59 Tweed Harvard. I've got a 67 Tele um, on the neck pickup, which is what Cropper tended to use. Now, he would use the back pickup some too, but uh, he tended to play on the neck pickup a lot. And I'm just I'm not going to play anything like note for note from Cropper, but this is just kind of maybe some cropper-isms or something. <laughs>
let's see. Uh, here's some more kind of cropperisms. You have the uh, the kind of hammer on things where you play chords and arpeggiate them and hammer off the uh, the 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 uh, the third up to the the fourth. Here you have the. kind of things. Uh, you have, of course, the rhythm chinks. Uh, you have the hammer-ons. Uh, you have the uh, chordal things like... So it would have been an E for like soul. Man. You know, those kind of things. The six. Yeah, Cropper, you know, had all sorts of you know great things in his uh, in his back pocket. He was, uh, and this is not to detract from Steve at all. He was not the most sophisticated guitar player, but he had such a great feel, and uh, you know, and and he worked really well with Al Jackson and Duck Dunn and Booker T. Yeah, it was a great, amazing rhythm section. So I love love Steve Cropper, love the Colonel. Uh, so as part of that, you know, as a kid, you're listening to these things and, uh, you know, of course, trying to learn stuff off records and stuff like that. And, uh, then, you know, there, this pre-internet and you start, uh, finding, you know, there'd be an article on Cropper every once in a while in guitar magazines, like, you know, about every two or three years there'd be something on him. And that's when I started hearing about this amp called the Fender Harvard. It's like you, you could have said the Fender Gersputen Gaboots. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, it's like, what is that? Now, of course, you know, I had seen all sorts of Fender amps, you know, growing up in South Texas. I had seen Twins and Pro Reverbs and Deluxes and Princetons and Showmans and Bandmasters and Basemans and all sorts of stuff. But I'd never seen a Harvard before. Never heard of one. So it was like, uh, what is that? So it wasn't until many years later uh, that... Uh, you know, on the on the internet was probably the first time I heard, or one of the uh, Fender amp books that uh, that came out in the in the nineties. Uh, I finally saw what one looked like. I was like, oh, okay, it's kind of a little, you know, practice amp kind of thing. So, uh, the way I actually got to play through one and how I ended up acquiring this one was there's a great young player named Daniel Donato. If you're not familiar with him, uh, he was the, uh, after J.D. Simo left the Don Kelly band, uh, Daniel Donato was the next player in that band, and, and Daniel is an amazing guitar player. And he was at the True Tone offices one day, and we were just, you know, yammering on. Of course, you start talking about gear, and uh, at the time, you know, he was very much into uh, pro reverb amps. and. Uh, he, uh, he said, I also have a 59 Harvard. And I said, you have a 59 Harvard? And he said, yeah, I, uh, I got it from, uh, you know, one of the guys at Groon and uh, I've got it. And he said, yeah, it's a fun amp, but I don't really use it very much. I'm thinking about selling it. I said, well, let me check it out. So he let me borrow it. And uh, there was, I, <laughs> I wanted to buy it, but you know, when you, when you have that thing where it's like, eh, I shouldn't buy it. So I returned it to him. And then, of course, I couldn't stop thinking about the Silly Amp. And I had the money to buy it, but I was like, no, nah, I don't need it. But then it was like, I, I just, I couldn't. So then I reached back out to, to Daniel and I said, hey, you still have that amp? And he said, yeah, but I don't know if I want to sell it now. And actually, someone else wants to buy it and they're offering me more money. So, oh, my goodness. See, it's like missed opportunity. So I had to offer more, offer more money, but I got it. And I'm glad. And... Uh, yeah, I'm glad that it has a, you know, kind of a fun lineage coming from, uh, and, and who knows who else has owned the amp. The amp has also been used by uh, J.D. Simo on some recordings, and uh, yeah, so I got this 59 Harvard amp. It was all original except the uh, the handle had been replaced, and, uh, you know, of course, these most of these rot, you know, the leather handle will rot, so it's, it's you know, it's incredibly unusual to have the original handle. The other thing was the original P10R speaker was gone. 
And, uh, but even though I just had a, a reissue Italian C10R ceramic Jensen speaker in there, the amp still sounded ridiculously good. So I, uh, I uh, picked it up. So, and then I, uh, I decided to, uh, to find an original P10R from 59. Boy, howdy, that was expensive. So it ended up costing me a couple hundred bucks. Uh, to find an, an original 1959 date stamp P10R with the California Fire Marshal orange sticker on the back, you know, because of course if, it was like, you know, if I'm going to do it, let's go all the way. So, and the speaker came out of a 59 basement that had uh, had been so heavily damaged that they were kind of, you know, parting it out. So uh, uh, a fellow collector. Uh, was kind enough to sell me the speaker and the one that had the uh, the sticker on it. So thank you. So uh, yeah, just a little bit more about the Harvard. The uh, Harvard was uh, part of the Fender lineup from 1955 until 1960. It never changed. Uh, you know, it, it was only in this narrow panel version. It was never wide panel or TV panel and never went to brown Tolex or anything else. This is the only version of the amp. Uh, yeah, it has a two 6V6s. It has a, a 6AT6 in V1. Uh, V2 is a 12X7, and then it has a two 6V6s and a 5Y3 rectifier. It has volume, tone, three inputs. The number one input is, you know, kind of full strength. And then the other two are attenuated. So if you had something with like really high output or a microphone, you might want to, you could plug those into one of the attenuated inputs. Of course, again, the P10R speaker, pine cabinet, really light, really easy to carry around, great sounding. And it's kind of the Steve Cropper amp. So that's what he used on, you know, everything that he did, uh, green onions all the way up until he recorded Soul Man with Sam and Dave. And at that point he switched to a blackface super reverb and, but he returned to the Harvard when they recorded Dock of the Bay uh, for the overdub. For the, for the tracking session, he played acoustic, which you can hear the acoustic, you know, at the very beginning of the song. And uh, then he overdubbed. And I think it was because he was overdubbing that he used the Harvard instead of the super reverb. And uh, yeah, and uh, as far as we know, he didn't really use the amp much, you know, past that. So, and now the amp, Cropper's Harvard is at the uh, Smithsonian now in Washington, D.C. So, uh, so what happened to the Harvard? Well, it got, it kind of got squashed out of the lineup. So originally, the bottom, you know, of the line was the Champ. And it, of course, was a Class A single-ended, meaning single output tube, uh, you know, had just had a one 6V6, you know, like five watts or so. Uh, and then they had the Princeton was a step up above that, and it was still a single-ended amp at that point, and it still had a six, a single six V six, uh, still like six or eight watts. Well, the Harvard was the step above the Princeton, and it had two six V six tubes, and it had a ten-inch speaker instead of like an eight, and so that's what uh, you know, because it was kind of like they had the two Ivy League amps. They had the Princeton and the Harvard, and the Harvard was the step up. Well, when Leo went to the Brown Amps in, you know, like, 61, he, uh, he decided to eliminate the Harvard. And it seems like the Harvard was not a popular amp because they're rare. They're incredibly rare. I mean, I see Tremoluxes and Vibroluxes and Basemans, you know, Tweed ones, you know, fairly often. But a Harvard is kind of hard to come by. And, uh, yeah, it got eliminated. So the Brown Princeton meant the death of the Harvard. So now people talk about some Harvards going out of the factory that only had a single output tube and an eight inch speaker. And that sounds like they were using kind of leftover Harvard badges with, um, you know, some tweed Princeton parts when the, uh, the brown Princeton was already out to, but uh, there are very few of those. So yeah, that's the amp. I love it. Uh, and the reason I love it is it's completely different than my uh, Deluxe Reverb. Now, the Deluxe Reverb is my favorite amp, and I have two of them. I have a 65 and a 67 Blackface, and, uh, and then this is my other amp. So I only own three guitar amps, two Deluxes and this Harvard. And I love the Harvard because it has completely its own sound. You know, it doesn't, 
You know, it doesn't sound anything like a Blackface Deluxe. And in fact, the reason why I don't like the Princeton Reverb is not because it doesn't sound great, it's because it's like every time I play through a Princeton, it sounds like a Deluxe, but without the bigger cabinet and the bigger speaker, and I always miss the Deluxe. So if I'm gonna do like a grab and go amp and I'm just you know going over to a friend's house or something, this is what I'm gonna take. It records great, uh, has a tight, you know, great sound. Uh, you can play kind of more Western swingy type of stuff on it. Obviously, it's very dry. You know, it doesn't have any type of effects, and I'm not using any effects with it today. You know, it's just guitar into the amp. Yeah, it's a it's a great fun amp, and so being able to get this amp kind of connected my love of you know vintage Fender and my love of Steve Cropper and all those great R&B records. And so to me, it's kind of like you know with I kind of have the uh, Reggie Young and uh, James Burton kind of thing with the deluxe, and this is kind of the uh, the cropper thing, and those kind of cover some of my favorite Telecaster sounds. I think I'll uh, I'm going to put together a, a Spotify playlist uh, of cropper stuff that uh, that would that, that features the Harvard, and uh, so you can hear a lot of that stuff, and uh, I think it's yeah, it has such a great sound, you know, bootleg and Green Onions and all those things. So, yeah. So the Fender Harvard, Steve Cropper. Uh, I still listen to Cropper all the time with Booker T and the MGs. I recently read uh, Booker T. Jones's uh, Time is Tight book, which was great. I highly recommend that. Uh, I'll also put some links to some different books on uh, stacks and uh, you know, maybe even like an instructional book or something like that in the, in the description for you know things if you want to really dig deep. If you want to dig even deeper on the Harvard, um, my fellow writer at Vintage Guitar Magazine, Dave Hunter, who's an amazing writer, he's written a bunch of you know, guitar books, uh, he did a full article on the Harvard for Vintage Guitar Magazine, and I will put the link to that if you really want to get in you know, deep onto you know, the, the tubes and, and you know, more into the nitty gritty on that. So, that's it. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I just, I love this amp, love having it, you know, it's kind of, it's like, you know, one of those things that I wanted as a kid and I was uh, able to find and it wasn't like crazy expensive and, uh, yeah. So I hope you all are having, uh, a great week. I know this is, you know, crazy times right now, but uh, I hope you'll uh, keep watching the show and this can be a fun distraction. I know it is for me. I'm so appreciative of everyone that has subscribed and everyone that's commented and everyone that said nice things and even the people that have said not so nice things, like saying I look like Fred Flintstone or uh, saying I pick my nose or <laughs> anything like that. Those are just, those are hilarious. So anyway, I hope you all have a great week and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.